Police pulled about three 55-gallon drums out a couple hours ago. We do not know where they were murdered. We do not know when they were murdered. And we do not know how long they have been in the barrel. He is the first serial killer to transfer those skills onto the Internet. I don't know if that uh, dramatic light opening uh, did anything for anyone, but I thought it was pretty cool. Or at least I thought it would be pretty cool. I've got this new stream deck, so I keep, I keep playing with it. Anyways, thank you so much for being back here with me today as we continue looking into cases that involved the internet as we explore the question of whether or not the worst monsters are no longer hiding in the dark, but are right here in front of our eyes in the light, beaming right into us from the technology in our hands. Today's case is a little bit of an anomaly, as the majority of the crimes perpetrated by this man took place prior to the dawn of the internet age. However, towards the end of his spree, he did use the internet as a means of finding victims and has since been dubbed by some the internet's first serial killer. So, I mean, it only seems appropriate that we look into the story of John Edward Robinson. And be warned, this man, he's a fucking animal. Before we begin, I do want to note that a lot of the details of this case you're about to hear comes from very intrepid reporting on the part of Vanity Fair, so thank you to them for helping illustrate tonight's story. The setting for our story takes place in Kansas, and not quite the Kansas we know from popular culture. You see, Kansas itself has quite a history of murder and mayhem, with a violent landscape dating back to the Wild West in the 19th century. The subject of our case tonight, John Edward Robinson, is of this very same historically violent Kansas and certainly did his part to continue carrying on the state's bloody legacy. Back in 1985, John Edward Robinson was also known to his neighbors as J.R., a successful businessman, an entrepreneur, a religious man, and neighborhood activist. He was also married with children, considered by many to be a doting father and husband. That's how it always begins, you know? It's always these, these nice, seemingly nice people, isn't it? You know, for a long time, when I first started at BuzzFeed, I was extremely, I, I think I'm a nice person. But when I started at BuzzFeed, I was particularly extra nice because I was, I was an intern and I wasn't hired yet. So, you know, I wanted, I wanted to get hired. So I was, like, I was extra nice. And uh, several people have told me that they suspected me of being a serial killer because of that. So, you know. But let's dial it back a bit further to Cicero, Illinois in 1943, the year Robinson was born. Robinson grew up with a fairly normal childhood, by all accounts, being the middle child of five. Eventually, Robinson would go on to become a lab technician and office manager for a physician in Kansas City. This position would mark the start of a wild series of run-ins with the law, the first of which took place in 1967 when he was found guilty of embezzling $33,000 from his employer and placed on probation for three years. While on probation, Robinson got a job as the manager of a TV rental company which he was fired from after he was caught stealing merchandise. Soon after, Robinson started work as a systems analyst for the Motor Oil Corporation, who would later fire him as well after he stole 6,200 postage stamps from them. Long story short, this man was a goddamn criminal, and just so I don't keep repeating myself, know that this pattern would keep repeating itself several more times as he would continue to steal and embezzle from multiple sources over the next few years, including stealing $30,000 from a retired teacher. What a, what a gem of a man. Somehow though, despite being put on probation for a third time in six years in 1976, by 1977, Robinson had racked up the means to move himself, his wife, and his children into a nine-room home on four acres in Kansas. At this time, Robinson started yet another career, this time in hydroponics, where he launched his own company called HydroGrow. However, according to Vanity Fair, around this time, Robinson's neighbors eventually began noticing their new neighbor would become prickly and even mean when upset. One neighbor told Vanity Fair a memory of Robinson showing her his hydroponics system and acting pleasant until she said something about the price being too high. At that point, Robinson snapped and told her, You've wasted my time. You're small potatoes. I will say, though, that the insult of calling someone small potatoes is, is quite uh, 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 bemusing to me. And it's something I may have to say more often now when people irk me. If someone annoys me, you know, get out of here. You're small potatoes. Neighbors also overheard him yelling at his wife and kids at times, needing to control his surroundings. Always. 
That said, we're not here to discuss the crimes of an arrogant con man. We're here to talk about something far worse. Because while Robinson had used his past companies to front his financial fraud and theft, Robinson's newer ventures had begun hiding something far more sinister. How John Edward Robinson had begun killing young women in a murder spree that would last almost two decades. In 1984, Robinson hired 19-year-old Paula Godfrey to work for him. An honor student and accomplished figure skater, Robinson had reportedly promised to enroll her in a professional training course in Texas and cover all of the expenses. However, the day of her departure for the training, Robinson picked her up from her parents' house to bring her to the airport, and she was never seen again. When she hadn't checked in with her parents several days later, the Godfreys reported she was missing. Police checked in with Robinson, who claimed not to know anything of her whereabouts. Shortly after, the police received a letter signed by Paula Godfrey that she was okay, but that she did not want to see her family. Because they had little other evidence to disprove this, the police ended their investigation. By Christmas 1984, about three months after Paula had already vanished, Robinson claimed he had founded the Kansas City Outreach Program whose alleged purpose was to help downtrodden women. In early January 1985, Robinson and the Kansas City Outreach were put in touch with their first philanthropic charge, 19-year-old Lisa Stacy, a single mother with a four-month-old daughter Tiffany. Promising her exciting job training sessions and living assistance, Robinson began corresponding with Lisa directly, but told her his name was John Osborne. But rather than putting her in an apartment, he put Lisa and Tiffany in a room at the Roadway Inn in Overland Park. On January 8, 1985, Robinson told Lisa he had made arrangements for her and the baby to travel to Chicago in the next few days. In addition, he asked her to sign four blank sheets of paper, as well as give him the addresses of her most important relatives. So now, obviously, Lisa's situation was unique, and, you know, this was her employer she was thinking of. But anytime anyone asks you to sign blank sheets of paper, don't do it. On January 9th, 1985, Lisa left in a hurry with Robinson, leaving all her belongings, bringing basically only Tiffany, and was never seen again. Lisa's sister-in-law, Kathy Klingensmith, would call the roadway in the next morning, and the clerk informed her that Lisa had checked out and her bill had already been paid by a John Robinson rather than a John Osborne. This next part is a little fucked up. On January 10th, the day after Lisa supposedly left with Robinson, the Robinsons threw a festive party at their home to celebrate the adoption of a baby. Specifically, an unconventionally rushed adoption that Robinson had apparently been able to set up for his brother and sister-in-law after they handed him $5,500 in cash. Both new parents would soon be back on their way to Chicago with a baby they had desperately dreamed of having for years. They named her Heather, obviously not knowing she already had a name. Tiffany. However, through all this, Robinson might not have been as smooth as he had hoped, as there were people growing suspicious of his alleged philanthropic work. Robinson, still on parole, was soon reported for his sketchy behavior to Stephen Hames, a district supervisor of the Missouri Board of Probation and Parole. Hames looked into Robinson and soon learned of his connection to the missing Lisa Stacy. However, after Hames checked in with detectives, they said there was no clear evidence of wrongdoing in Lisa's disappearance, so they were not pursuing it further. However, they also noted that a second young woman named Paula Godfrey, who also had a connection to Robinson, had gone missing a few months earlier. Though, once again, they were not pursuing that case either. I know it's easy to sometimes rag on, on you know, incompetent cops in cases like these, but I mean, come on. Despite these connections, they decided not to pursue the case. That just boggles my mind. Knowing now that there was another missing woman, Hames decided to get the FBI involved, calling his contact at the Kansas City field office and saying, you need to take a look at this. We've got two women and a baby missing. We've got Robinson crossing state lines. From there, the FBI put two agents on the case to begin an inquiry. However, nothing could link Robinson to the disappearances of Lisa, her baby, and Paula. Yet. Hames would question Robinson specifically about Lisa but he claimed not to know much except that she had run away with a man named Bill to Colorado. In an even later interview, Robinson told Hames, Why is everybody making such a big deal when I'm only trying to help people? By the way, Lisa Stacy has been found. She's okay. Tiffany, the baby, everybody's okay. As always, when it comes to these accents, they're shot in the dark on my part, so apologies uh, to anyone from Kansas out there. 
Robinson claimed he had heard about Lisa's new situation from a woman Lisa used to babysit for, but when this woman was questioned, she admitted that Lisa had never worked for her. Rather, Robinson had asked her to lie to the police, and she had complied because she owed him money, and he had nude photographs of her as collateral from when she was a prospective sex worker with him. And now this leads to a whole other side of Robinson's secret life. Because around the same time of these first few crimes, Robinson had also become interested in sadomasochistic sex, and not only engaged in BDSM relationships for pleasure, but because he had also seen it as another illicit means of making money. He had begun organizing an S&M friendly ring of prostitutes for customers. One of the women Robinson had been introduced to as a potential sex worker was Teresa Williams, who was 21 years old, working odd jobs, and who soon accepted a position with him as his mistress. Being his mistress required she not only offer sexual services to him, but also to anyone else he desired her to sleep with. In exchange, he would pay for her apartment, her expenses, additional prostitution fees, and he would supply her with drugs like marijuana and amphetamines. In a horrific incident in May 1985, Robinson barged himself into Teresa's bedroom while she was sleeping. He pulled her by her hair, took her over his knee, and began spanking her while threatening, you've been a real bad girl, you need to learn a lesson. At this point, Robinson threw her to the ground and pointed a revolver at her, aiming at her head. He said, if you don't shut up, I'll blow your brains out. He then proceeded to stick the barrel of the gun into her vagina and said, I'll bet you've never had a blowout. Teresa wept and pleaded with him to spare her, and he left her crying on the floor. On June 7, 1985, FBI agents visited Teresa, and after they told her they were investigating Robinson for the disappearance of two young women, she began to cry and told them of the assault. Based on the multiple violations of his parole and supplying drugs to Teresa, Stephen Hames was able to revoke Robinson's probation and put him back in jail. And finally, finally, after being convicted of fraud for a second time, he was sentenced to prison for a term between 6 and 19 years. However, he would not be sent to prison in time to prevent him from killing yet another woman. Because somehow, during the middle of his litigation, while going in and out of jail on bail, a 27-year-old woman named Catherine Clampett, who had begun working for Robinson in early 1987, also went missing. Yet, once again, somehow, there was insufficient evidence to link her disappearance to Robinson, who, even as we speak, was about to be transported to his new home in a Kansas prison. But even from behind bars, the depths of this man's scheming and depraved mind seemingly knew no bounds. While in prison, Robinson had found his way into the good graces of William Bonner, the physician at the Missouri prison where he was incarcerated, as well as his 47-year-old wife, Beverly Bonner, the prison librarian, who gave Robinson a job. After Robinson's release in the spring of 1993, Beverly Bonner filed for divorce and left her husband. In early 1994, she moved to the Kansas City area where she could rejoin Robinson, who made her the president of Hydro Grow Incorporated, the hydroponics company he had started years before. Shortly after, Beverly's mother reported that she had gotten letters from Beverly, telling her that her new job at Hydro Grow was sending her for a lot of work trips abroad. However, she didn't give her mother a return address. Rather, all her mail had been directed to a post office box in Olathe, including her alimony checks. And after January 1994, no one saw Beverly ever again. And soon after Beverly's disappearance, Robinson would take his murderous spree onto new, uncharted territory, a newfangled thing called the internet. In 1994, Robinson also began corresponding with 45-year-old Sheila Faith. Most people do believe this began after meeting in an internet chat room, although there is some speculation that it could have also been through a newspaper ad. Sheila was known to be a lonely woman, a single mother and widow who was struggling deeply with a need for companionship. Shortly after they began talking, Sheila told her friends that she had met her dream man, known only to them as John. In the summer of 1994, Sheila and her daughter Debbie who used a wheelchair, had planned to travel to Texas, and Sheila planned to meet up with Robinson on the way. Before she could make her way to Robinson, however, he surprised her by driving to Colorado and picking her and Debbie up in the middle of the night. After that night, neither mother nor daughter was ever seen alive again. 
With the internet now at his disposal, Robinson would go on to murder two more women whom he met online and convinced to move to Kansas, Isabel Lewicka, a Polish immigrant who began interacting with Robinson online in 1997, and Suzette Troughton, a 27-year-old in-home nurse who met him online in the fall of 1999. Ultimately, both women would also disappear, with Isabel going missing in August 1999 after Robinson moved her into an apartment and Suzette vanishing before she was due to go on a trip with Robinson in March of 2000. In Isabel's case, Robinson told a business associate that she was caught smoking pot with her boyfriend and had been deported. And after Suzette's mother called Robinson to get answers, he told her she left with a man named James Turner after deciding not to accept the job he had offered her after all. At this point, Suzette's family contacted the police in Lenexa, Kansas, where Suzette's temporary accommodations were, to report her missing, and an inquiry was immediately opened to look into the disappearance by Detective David Brown. He looked into Robinson and noticed the potential missing women who had been reported to the Overland Park Police Department during the 80s and had connections to Robinson. Things would then soon come to a head, as shortly before Suzette Troughton's disappearance, Robinson had also begun contact with another potential victim, Jean. A divorced 34-year-old professional from the Southwest looking for a man to begin a BDSM relationship with, who could also employ her professionally. Robinson introduced himself as James Turner to Jean, who agreed to move to Kansas and worked for him. As the investigation into Suzette's disappearance was underway, the two began engaging in BDSM. However, after one particularly bad beating, Jean ran to the hotel's front desk sobbing hysterically. She asked to see the registration card for her room when she discovered the true identity of James Turner. She called the police and Detective David Brown arrived at the hotel two months into his investigation of Robinson. Around a week later, on June 2nd, nine police vehicles arrived at the Robinson's residence in Olathe. Robinson was put under arrest, charged with sexual assault, and brought into the Johnson County Jail. At his home, detectives also seized all five of Robinson's computers and found a blank stationery sheet signed by Lisa Stacy over 15 years before, as well as receipts from the Roadway Inn indicating that Robinson had checked Lisa out of a hotel on January 10, 1985, the day after she disappeared with him. But soon after, even more horrifying evidence was discovered. Because as authorities scavenged a 16-acre plot owned by Robinson, a forensic investigator found two female bodies in metal barrels. In the first one, the naked body was head down in the barrel with over a foot of liquid from her decomposition in the bottom. In the second one, there was a pillow on top once the lid was removed. Below it was another body in more decomposition liquid. Both bodies were determined to have sustained strong blows to their heads, with the second body's wounds seemingly coming from a large hammer. The bodies were confirmed to be those of Suzette Troughton and Isabel Levitska. In the coming days, three barrels containing three more bodies were found in a storage unit belonging to Robinson in Raymore, Missouri. These bodies were ultimately identified as those of Beverly Bonner, Sheila Faith, and Sheila's daughter, Debbie Faith. Robinson was charged in both Kansas and Missouri for crimes involving all of the women whose bodies were found, as well as in the case of Lisa Stacy, despite a body never being found. In the Kansas trial, there were over 100 witnesses called and over 23,000 pages of police files for the case, according to one prosecutor. And at one point, a 39-minute sex tape of Suzette and Robinson was played for the jury. I think sometimes we're guilty, myself included, of not realizing just how, how terrible the trial process is for you know, the victim's families. The thought of your daughter, your sister, you know, in that, and a tape like that being shown to complete strangers, it's just it's, it's horrifying. On October 29, 2002, the Kansas jury unanimously convicted Robinson, who was sentenced to two death sentences, one each for the capital murders of Suzette and Isabel, life in prison with the possibility of parole after 15 years for the first-degree murder of Lisa Stacy, and further years in prison for the aggravated kidnapping of Suzette, the aggravated interference in parental custody of Lisa's daughter Tiffany, and a theft charge. In the Missouri trial, Robinson was found guilty and received a life sentence without parole for each count of first-degree murder in the deaths of Beverly Bonner, Debbie and Sheila Faith, Catherine Clampett, and Paula Godfrey. Prosecutors hoped that in entering into a plea deal to avoid the death penalty, Robinson would give up information on the location of the missing women, but he never did. As of today, John Edward Robinson remains in prison as he continues to file appeals for his death sentence. If we are to go back to our question of whether or not the worst monsters are no longer hiding in the dark, but here in the light of the technology in front of our eyes, in this case, 
the internet really didn't actually play much of a part. Yes, he used it to find victims, but ultimately, whether or not he had the internet, this man would have kept killing women until he was caught. People were doing terrible things before the internet, and if somehow the internet were to just shut off for the rest of time tomorrow, which I hope it doesn't, but if it were, people will find ways to do terrible things without the internet as well. Scary thought. And uh, I guess I'm going to leave you with that. But on that note, thank you so much, though, for tuning in and listening. And as always, if you have a case you'd like me to explore with all of you, please be sure to leave us a comment down below or shoot me a message. And who knows, maybe next time we'll be diving into a not-so-fun case that you've shared with all of us. Thank you, and stay safe online. Thank you.